Thank you, my friend, Mr. Mark. Don Friday is not here. I miss him, of course. But certainly, all distinguished friends of Institute of Cultural Diplomacy, ever since I came to Berlin, this has been a, a place where I have frequented as much I have frequented the foreign ministry. <laughs> so you can imagine how much importance I, have, I give to cultural diplomacy. Uh, you see, I, when I came to Berlin, I, when I met people who were interested in culture, I said Pakistan is a, is a place, uh, an amazing place where you have history, geography, culture, music, literature, all into one. So I said I will try to, during my tenure, I will try to bring the icons of Pakistan, the, 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 the legends of Pakistan to Berlin. And uh, in the last one and a half year I have been here, we have been able to uh, bring two legends here, or at least three, three four legends here. But uh, you know, uh, today uh, I introduce you, uh, Mr. Jimmy Engineer as well. Jimmy is one name that most Pakistani would recognize immediately, apart from their historical heroes. But Jimmy is a living legend. Jimmy, why is he legend? Is he a legend just because he's a painter? He's an artist? He's number one artist, number one painter, number one uh, calligraphist? Is, he because, is it because of that he's a legend? Why is he a legend at the moment? You see, Jimmy is a legend for many reasons. Jimmy Engineer, as the name is sometimes the foreigners, and even Pakistanis would say, Jimmy Engineer sounds very you know, very, you can say, sometimes very uh, different uh, to the Pakistani name nomenclature. Jimmy is, of course, uh, you know, uh, is, uh, Jimmy has the distinction of belonging to the Pakistan's smallest minority, and that's Zoroastrians. And the Zoroastrians is, are the smallest minority because only there are 3,000 of them in Pakistan. Jimmy was born in Baluchistan, a, pro a province, uh, and the area was Lorelei. Jimmy got educated in Lahore, the heart of Punjab and the heart of Pakistan. And Jimmy is living in Karachi, the industrial and the commercial heartbeat of Pakistan. So Jimmy has everything Pakistan in him. And that what makes legend in him you see his painting, his painting, his art, his calligraphy is unique to him. There is no Jimmy before him, and there is no Jimmy after him. So Jimmy, uh, you see, when he does a painting, it's an inspirational painting. Some of his paintings that I saw, he has done nearly, I think, more than 2,000 paintings, and he has also published a book. The, the weight of the book needs at least two people to carry it. So that is the reason that you don't see the book here, but it is a quite, a, quite a heavy book. And it has 1,000 paintings in, inside it, all the, uh, the prints of the painting. So I introduce Jimmy Engineer to you, because this is, is one of the legends that I promised to bring to Berlin. He has come to Berlin before, but I wanted to, him to be coming into Berlin during my tenure here. He was going from London to Washington. So I said, it cannot be that you go to London to Washington and you are in Europe and you can't come to me. So Jimmy was very kind. He obliged me and by his presence in Berlin. Berlin is a beautiful city. I call it a bright city because I see Berlin very, very beautiful. It, I, when I came here, I say to everyone, I am retiring after a month, but Berlin seems to have made me 20 years younger. <laughs> I, always, I, I don't feel like retiring. I feel rather I'm beginning at, at this moment. And my life is starting, is starting at 60, actually. But that's all because of Berlin. Berlin makes all of us younger. And it's the Berlin spirit. So I introduce you, my, my, one of my best friends, one of my best you know, uh, personalities whom I respect. He, 
he is legend to the people of Pakistan. He's the voice of the people of Pakistan. He's a social activist. He's a philanthropist. He's a great social worker. You know, there's a lot about Jimmy that m many people do not know. He, he is really, he belongs to the people. And that's what makes him a legend. Uh, I, I, I think I will leave it to him to tell you. He's an inspirational, very, very inspirational figure. I wish we had have more of Jimmy's in Pakistan. With these words, I introduce you. Mr. Jimmy, the floor is for you. I am grateful to our ambassador who always uses very kind words. I want to thank Rosie for also introducing me and this Cultural Diplomacy Institute and all the enlightened people sitting in this hall. I want to say good evening to you. I will briefly talk about my life because sometimes I feel my life is endless. I will talk when I was six years old. I fell very ill. All, my, all the doctors told my parents that your son will not live more than three months. But exactly after three months, I became very healthy. So my parents told all the doctors that you said our son will die in three months, but he is very healthy. So doctors said it cannot be because it is against medical science that if somebody has both the kidneys not working, you cannot live. People can live with one kidney but people cannot live if they don't have both the kidneys. So doctor said, you please bring your son to us. We want to have a look at him. So my parents took me to the doctor and they checked whether there was some operation, cut or transplant or whatever it is. In 1960, there was no transplant of kidney anywhere in the world, anywhere. So doctor said, we want to look at his kidneys. So our parents said, OK, you check him. So when they x-rayed and saw my body and saw the kidneys, they told the parents that what happened? The parents said, you should be knowing. You're a doctor. So actually, there were two brand new kidneys in my body given to me by nature. So that is why all my life, I have tried to give back to him for giving me that life. That is why I give to charities all over the world. For 40 years, whatever I've earned, over 70% I've given away to homeless, to orphans, to blind, to prisoners, to widows, to everybody who requires money. So this is the reason why my thinking is like that. I never wanted to be an artist only. I wanted to help humanity at large. I have come to Berlin many times, about 10 or 12 times. And sometimes I used to take walks at night in Berlin and other places in Germany. And anybody I would see on the side roads, sitting down, who needed food or something, I would give to them. And the bakery person would ask me, why are you buying so many breads and things? I told him, I want to give to those good people who are sitting outside. So as an artist, I started work when I was five years old. I used to sit on large pieces of paper and use powder colors and with my finger make designs and abstraction. From that, I developed my creativity. I used to get dreams about the greatest work I did was on partition of India. I made series of them. 
So I have to see these scenes in my dreams because I was not born in 47. I started this work in 1970s. And then I used to relate my dreams on the canvases. And after this, I started working on landscapes and still life and seascape and architectural work and philosophical work and all sorts of painting. And people usually ask me, which artist inspires you? So I tell them that I'm a student, but I'm the student of nature. I'm the student of that master who is perfect. That is why all my life I will remain a student. I will never become a master because I am that master's student who is perfect. Because I want to learn till the end of my life that how you can bring art to a level of excellence, of composition, of balance, or colors. And I'm still learning art. And I enjoy the work of students and artists all over the world I go, I make sure that I look at the works of all the other people who create. And I appreciate the work done by all the young artists, senior artists, or very well-known artists. Because we must appreciate everybody's work. Because everybody has the right to create the way they want. But my social work, I was a human rights activist also, and a peace activist also. And I did social work also. And I was, as an artist, I was creative. So I was trying to balance out four different ways of thinking as a one person. Because as a human rights activist, I used to fight for the rights of many people on the roads and everywhere. As a peace activist, I had to be very peaceful, calm, and very nice. As a human right, I had to be aggressive. As a social worker, I had to feel the pain and agony of all the people who I went. And as an artist, I was idealist. So it was all combination of all these three, four things together. In this hall, I can stand and talk for hours, but I will not be able to change even the life of one person. So in 1994, I started a walk. I walked 4,700 kilometers in one year through all the villages and towns of my country and met millions of people. Daily, I was walking 30 to 40 kilometers every day by foot, in the sun, in the cold weather, through the desert, through the jungle, through the villages, I walked and met people. And I wanted to see how the sufferings of people with my eyes. And people used to ask me, okay, what is your religion? So I used to tell them that I was born in the Zoroastrian religion. Most Germans would know Zarathustra, because he was our prophet, because Nietzsche wrote a book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. So he was our prophet. So I told them that if somebody calls me a Muslim, I say, thank you very much. And if somebody calls me a Christian or a Hindu, I still say, thank you very much. Very kind of you. Because if you want to understand the sufferings of humanity all over the world, then you must first understand the faith of those people, their way of thinking, their way of living. Unless you don't understand their way of living, their thinking, you cannot alleviate their sufferings. You cannot even understand how people suffer, how different people suffer on different levels. So I started this long walk. I went all over the country, met people. I tried to help them. I was Floods came in the middle of my walk. I was walking in the floods. Then winter came. I walked in the winter also in the cold regions. After this walk, I did over 150 walks. I did a walk. My 
most famous walk was when I was going to walk from our capital to the Indian capital, Delhi. And I was wearing the flags of both the countries. The people in my country said, how will you carry their flag? Somebody will come and harm you. I said, when I'm walking for peace, then I'm not bothered if somebody will come and harm me or not. But I walked from our capital to the Indian borders. And then when I reached the borders, our diplomatic ties had completely finished in 2001. There was no diplomatic ties between us. So I was on the border, and there were these international media there. They said, please cross. We will make breaking news of you. All the radio channels, the international, they were all waiting for me to cross. I was standing on that line. And when I came there, our rangers welcomed me. And they said nothing to me. They said, we know all about you. So you can do whatever you feel like. So I was standing on that line which divides our country with India. And I was wearing that uniform also. And these press people said, cross. So I said, let me meditate on that line and see that without a dip diplomatic ties or anything, should I cross or should I just sit on that line and tell you what my feelings were. So I sat on that line for five minutes, and then I got up, and I said to the media that my walk ends here. They said, why? They said, we are giving you all the coverage and everything. I said, that's fine. But I said, I will cross. You will give me headline news. And after three days, when India throws me out, you will be the same people standing there to cover me up. So I said, I wanted to wake the people up for a certain cause. So I did my purpose. And if the diplomatic ties was good, I would have gone to Delhi because I had sponsors there, I had proper posters there, everything was there. So I closed my walk there. Then I walked for leprosy for a German lady who's a legend in our country. Her name is Ruth Fau. So I walked for her. So I, what I did, I told her to bring all her ambulances with all the leprosy patients sitting in the ambulance. And I was walking in front of all those ambulances. And I took a whole round of about 20 kilometers or so with all the ambulances. So I walked for cancer, for blight children, for many causes. The other passion I had was to change the lives of special children with special needs. So in my country, there are a lot of institutions of special children, but there is no way of entertainment. And they were never part of our society. So what I did, I started fun and food for special children. So I did over 200 programs for these children. I used to book all these five-star hotels, public places for these children. And then I used to take 500 children and 1,000 children and 2,000 children to all these hotels, make them the VIPs, and then give them the best food, call the media to see them, talk to them, and entertain them. And in all my programs, I never called any VIP. I used to tell them, you are my VIP. So slowly, slowly, when I did this program, other people started taking interest. Because first, the parents used to be very embarrassed about their children. They would not take them out publicly. But after I did all these programs, parents used to call me, please take our child also. So I started awareness about the special children. Because unless we don't accept them, just calling them special and we think special for them, it's no good. We have to give them special treatment, special love, special feelings. So 11 years, I continuously did this program so that people would accept them. And now people understand what is their requirement, and they help them. Then my passion was to go to jails, meet prisoners, work with them, go to ladies' jail, help them. 
because I felt that when I used to go in the jail and I used to work with these juvenile, these young boys, and I used to tell them that we all can make a mistake, but we can improve ourselves. So I used to make them feel good because I used to tell them that I'm willing to stay in the jail with you for a couple of days to make you understand that when you come out, you can be better human beings. You can live your life. Then I started art in the jails. And then I had organized programs of exhibiting their works outside for raising money for them. So I always wanted to do social work. As an artist in 89, I got the highest recognition in USA. I was the only Pakistani to get the National Endowment of the Arts Award of USA. And they invited me for 75 days because of that award. But then I said, I want to go back to my country because I wanted to help my people. I was a disciple of one of the greatest Sufis in the Punjab. His name was Sufi Barkat Ali. He died in 96. And one day in 79, he suddenly got up and he said, you sit on my cushion. So I was just wondering why he asked me to sit on his cushion. So I sat on his cushion and then all the young children there, he said, you recite the national anthem of Pakistan. So the, all the young children were reciting the national anthem. I'm sitting on his cushion. He's standing up. And there's one old gentleman who had a big fan. He was doing like this. And after the national anthem, the Sufi came to me and he said, work has been done. So I asked him, what? What work? He said, you are servant of Pakistan. And you'll always remain a servant. So wherever I travel all over the world, in the books that I enter my designation, I write Servant of Pakistan. Because that is why I have never, when I'm invited to some organization board that you please join our cultural board, I said I cannot do it. I'm a servant. Because I have to serve. I have to just serve the people. I have to serve my country. I have to serve humanity. So I can't be on any board or anything like that. So I am very proud to be the servant of Pakistan. Because I feel that I should give my whole life to my country, my people, and any human beings, anywhere in any country of the world. I always say, if people need my help, Germany, I'm willing to help them. If my people need if people need in Singapore, I'm ready to help. In any country, USA, wherever I go, wherever I talk. I was in May, I was called to the Harvard University in Boston. I said that. I said I'm ready to help anybody in any country. If the international media portrays our country negatively, so I tell the people all over the world, we have got positive people also. There are two people in our country. I've gone to USA, I've asked them, that have you got these two people? They said, no. I've asked in UK, there are two people. One is one of our social worker, his name is Abdul Sattar Eidi. He's one of the great, greatest social worker. And his name is in the Book of Guinness as the largest numbers of ambulances. He's got air ambulances. And he was a poor man and he's got the largest ambulance service. And then there is a doctor named Adibul Hassan Rizvi. He's the head of SIUT. This man gives 400 dialysis free to people every day. And he does hundreds of operations free. In his hospital, bed is free, medicine is free, operation is free, food is free. After the treatment, medicine is free. If a minister comes, he's next to maybe a beggar who's on the bed. He said, there's no distinction in my hospital. The women are on the same room. The men are in the same room. 
So I asked America, do you have somebody who gives 400 dialysis free, who gives, who does hundreds of operations? They said, no. Then I said, why do you think negatively about our country? We have got great people. Individually, I've met Pakistanis all over the world. They are most outstanding people in the world. And I'm proud. Wherever I go, I say, I'm proud to be a Pakistani. So we have got so many people like them, which other countries don't have, who are willing to give everything to everybody. So as an artist, I feel I did what I could do. As much as God gave me, I tried to express myself. I tried to help people. And today I see so many intelligent, enlightened people sitting in this hall. And I'm sure they will all do their best in their lives to change people's life. Because you, anybody can change the lives of people. It only takes some kind of love, compassion, and a little bit understanding. So I'm very grateful to all of you. You came, and I'm grateful to you and my ambassador who organized this talk, and all the people from my embassy. They're all my very good friends. So I'm very happy. And all the youngsters here, they will all be great people in the world, I'm sure. They will show their talents to the world. So I thank you. I thank everybody. If there's anybody who wants to ask me any question, I would like to answer question. But since I'm deaf, somebody will have to speak very loudly. You'll have to speak loudly. I can hardly hear. Do you think that you would Can have you done? Here, I have no idea. Do you think that you, you would have done the same no. if you were born in another part of the world? My question is: uh, If I would have been born, she asks. <laughs> I have a very loud voice. She asks if if you think if you were born in another place in the world. In, um, in the US, the UK, not Pakistan, do you think that it would change you? Where it was different? different? <laughs> would have, I will give would, you a very simple... Your mission, would have, your mission would have been the same. OK, let me answer this question. I would know about it, because I was only born in my country. If I would be born, one cannot speculate that if I was born in Switzerland or I would be born in Paris, what would I have done? So I really don't know. But I think I'm happy that I was born in the most remote place in Pakistan. It is the most remote, most uh, the province which has the less facilities than all the provinces I was born there. And in that province, the most remote place, Lorelei, I was born there. So I don't know whether I would have been born in another country, but I'm happy that I was born there. I have a practical question. You have a question? Uh, yes, a practical, uh, I mean, more technical to know also, yes. uh, because it's interesting me. Uh, mm. Uh, did you uh, uh, study professionally art? Okay, I will tell you, I'll give you this answer. I, after school, my parents put me in a college to do commerce or something like that. So in the class, I used to draw all the time. So my professor came to me, he said, this is economic class, this is not drawing class. So he said, why don't you join some art college? So all the professors in that university said the same thing to me, that this is the math, this is not drawing class. So I told my parents, all the professors say I should be in some art college. So my parents 
put me in an arts institute, National College of Arts. So my parents said, okay, you should do designing because finance is very difficult to you know, live a life out of it. So I said, okay. So they put me in designing. I was in designing, but I was painting whole day in the finance studio. So my professor, after six months, he said, why don't you join the fine arts? Because it's so, uh, you are doing painting and you are not doing concentrating on designing. So I went to the professor of fine arts. I said, will you take me in fine arts? They said, surely, we'll take you. So when I joined fine arts, I was the only student at that time working whole night and day. In the, so the gatekeeper there used to ask me that everybody go home. Why don't you go home? I said, I'm using your facilities. That's why I don't have this facility there. He said, OK, fine. So when I was in my final year, there was a discussion in the college that do artists need a degree or not? So I said, why are you arguing? Let me walk out of the gate. So I, in my final year, I just walked out of the gate. And I said to my principal, I'm leaving. He said, why? I said, I want to see whether one can survive without a degree or not. So I just walked away to my parents and said, what happened? I said, I want to see whether I can survive or not. So this is my brief history I gave you. But most parents used to tell me, please don't talk about this in your lectures. Because we don't want our children to walk out of institution to see whether they can survive or not. <laughs> but <laughs> this is my brief uh, this thing, history. This is what I actually did. Until now, I never went back to take a degree or anything like that. I just walked out. Sir, my name is Kashif. I'm from India. From? India. OK. I would like to know, have you recently done any exhibition back in India? And if you did, uh, what, was your, what was the reaction from the audience? Actually, Thank I you. Have, I've never gone to India, but there was a book, uh, something to do with heavens. Mm -hmm. Somebody wrote, and they used my work in that book printed in India. Then a lot of people have taken prints of my work and displayed there, displayed there. Then some museum came and they wanted images of partition. I gave them, gave them. But I held an exhibition in Houston at a gallery owned by an Indian. He had never exhibited Pakistani art, but he said, I will do your artwork. So I did, because I have painted a lot of architecture of India. If you go to my website and look at the architecture, I have, when I was painting Pakistani architecture, I was painting Indian architecture also. But that people have seen on internet and everything, people of India, and they have appreciated my work, what I've done. And if you go to the internet, you will also see that I've meticulously painted Indian architecture. So also. if we want to invite you, would you be able to come over? I don't know. They, I've, I've never found that visas in India is very simple. I mean, the ambassador is sitting here. You can ask him. <laughs> <laughs> he, might, he might help you in the diplomatic way. <laughs> Thank but, you. Uh, but I will tell you something, that all the people, India, majority, and the people in Pakistan, they all want to be friends, actually, people to people. They want to be friends. But I don't know about politicians, but I know about people. They want to. Because all the people who come to Pakistan, they appreciate our country and vice versa. Thank you. Thank you. Since we're here at the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, I want to ask a follow-up question. I believe as well that the people can very often have a very powerful voice of bringing reconciliation and peace. Do you think that art can serve as a vehicle for diplomacy? And do you think that art can assist at building bridges that would lead to peace in general? Can you just uh, this thing? I, I right, I'll, I'll try one more time. If not, I'll give it to Ruzi. Uh, do you think that art can serve as a form of diplomacy? And do you think that art can help art. to bring peace 
around uh, the world, art, and, and the role of an artist as an individual. You, you mean say that art for the sake of peace? For example, uh, yes. Do you think that art can contribute to building bridges that will lead to peace? And what do you see as the role of the artist, such as yourself, in also building bridges? I have just uh, Art as a expression of peace? as a tool in order to help to make peace, the art okay, itself, okay, okay. Yes. And, the, and, the, and the role of artist. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, art has always been a vehicle of peace, actually, because uh, artists and art have no boundaries. Any artist will speak the same language that all the artists of the world speak by expression on canvas. So I don't think artists are bound by boundaries or by any lines. They are free people. They express themselves freely. And a lot of artists have given great statements, political, for peace also, and they have spoken out for violence also. Not only violence country to country, violence to women, violence to children, violence to humanity. So people have all their life portrayed things in the art. Because art is a very powerful medium. You make one controversial painting, and the whole media and everything, there's so much hype. So art is a powerful expression, very powerful. Yes, it can, it can work for peace, and it can create divide also. If you paint something that is very sensitive to some country, you paint that, and that country will start writing against that artist, I think. So it has happened. So art is very powerful. Yes, it's a very powerful medium, and it can be used for peaceful purposes. It can bring people together. It can bring nations together. It can bring so many people of different thinking together. So it's a very uh, great uh, expression, yes, it is. Art, if it's used properly, it can, it can do wonders. I wanted to ask something after what you said about not being in India, never, but painting a lot of Indian architecture. What made you uh, paint the Indian architecture? Yeah. Actually, I was making a whole series of 54 paintings on architecture, and they were very detailed work. So I selected countries like Uzbekistan, the blue mosque, and I think I used their architecture, Indian, Pakistani. There were about 28 paintings purely of Pakistani architecture, and there were some paintings which had like Pakistan, India, and Cambodia or Mexico, and something like that. So I had a combination. And then there are countries like Uzbekistan and other places. So I, my philosophy was that if buildings of different countries can be composed together, so can peaceful thinking also. So that was the whole thing was that the whole series was called the, the Harmony and Peace series. So that's why I made this painting. And it took me 13 years to paint this series, because uh, it took me three years to draw and 10 years to paint all these 54 paintings. So it took a lot of hard work, because I wanted that the level of excellence should be there in the execution. And the compositions were very, very uh, sort of complex composition. Like there were like 30 buildings of different areas put together. They should be balanced also. The colors also should balance out, nothing jumping around here and there. So it took a lot of thinking and a lot of hard work to compose those things. You can come closer from there. I don't think I'll be able to hear anything. I'm sorry that no. I have. No problem, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, hello, thank you very much. Uh, if you have to choose between being an artist or a peace activist or a human rights activist or a social 
um, defender and worker. Which one would you choose? All of them. <laughs> Why? Because, because I will tell you, I have seen artists all over the world, some of the best artists of USA. I've met them also. And I've met other great artists. But then they only think about the art. And they have no feeling of anybody, even if they look with their eyes, who is dying, or who is in hunger, or who needs help. So they close their eyes, and they concentrate on art. I could have done the same thing. After my recognition in USA, I had all the opportunities people offered me to be my lawyers, be my managers, and everything. But I didn't need that. And in UK also, in 1979, there were some galleries who wanted to be my agent. I didn't want that. Because I've said that if you are just an artist, and if you cannot help people, then what is the use? There are great musicians in this world, but there are musicians who help humanity. They are respected more. There are sportsmen, like tennis stars, like Roger Federer and all, who is respected more because they do charity work. Like Andre Agassi, he's a tennis player, but he does charity. So if you help humanity and you do anything in your life, you will be happier. Your soul will be happier. Your inner self will be happier. When I met Mother Teresa, I had two hours of conversation with her. And she said that when people put their last days in my lap, and I help them to pass from this life to the next life, that is the greatest thing I felt. So I can tell you something. If you can feel the pain of people being a writer, poet, artist, musician, that is the greatest thing you can do. I don't care if as an artist people appreciate or not. And I will tell you something. Only 30% of my social work is documented. 70% is only known to me and God. Nobody else knows. Because people don't even know what social work is. People think ambulance service, this is, is called good service. It's not the highest form of social work. The highest form of social work is when you and only the sufferer knows. That's it. Nobody else knows. I thought you had a very difficult question written on the no, paper. No, no. <laughs> no, by the way, I just wanted to make a note. Yara, is, introduce yourself, please. Yeah, uh, actually, I'm uh, doing my PhD here. In You're inter doing a PhD, PhD in international relations and cultural diplomacy. And I'm also doing another PhD in, uh, in the PhD. cultural heritage management and preservation. Um, I've done my master's in the history of art. I'm coming from an artist uh, family. That's why, actually, I asked you this question, okay. because I keep asking the same question to for them? my dad. Do you get the same answer? Uh, somehow, because, um, well, my dad uh, said that he likes to be artist first, because without being an artist, you won't be as sensitive to the rest mm. as with that mission. So uh, actually, but uh, your, your answer is more comprehensive and I'm also very, very hypersensitive. But when I went to see the human beings who were burnt, to look at them, you have to become slightly harder. Because if you are so sensitive, you can't even look at these people. So I made myself like this so that I can see the miseries of people also and not fall sick. Because when I tell people from very high society to come with me to see these people, they come once. But that is the first and the last time. Because then they say that we felt sick. So you have to first be that much strong to be able to see so much pain of people. So that is why I think that your father is right. That first artist, to be sensitive, and then to help people. Thank you. 
Yeah, he's coming also from Syria. What? Syria. Oh. Okay. Syria is in the news nowadays. Exactly. Sometimes some countries in the news nowadays they are in the news. And I'm coming from Israel. What? I'm coming from Israel. Okay, wow. Yes, and uh, me and Yara are very good friends. <laughs> so you are both sitting here. This picture should be put on the net, actually. You <laughs> spoke before about India and Pakistan, yes, about yes. the people. Yes, yes. I think these, that me and Yara these, can say yeah. the Listen, same. If his picture, your picture, her picture, my picture come together, that would be unique, you know. This is, this is cultural diplomacy is all yeah. about. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. More questions? Okay, so Mark, you can... All right, well, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, first introduce myself, uh, Mark Donfried, the director and founder of the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy. And we are really very, very grateful to you, Mr. Engineer, for having come. Uh, this was an honor for our institute, uh, given all of the work that you've had. We always say with the students uh, and the, the staff and the volunteers at the institute, for us, most important are drivers, not passengers. And I think in the best sense of the word, that is exactly what your entire life you have exemplified, to be a driver, to move things forward, uh, to bring people together who wouldn't come together. And I think exactly the examples that you shared with us today really give us inspiration uh, for how we can take our responsibility as citizens, no matter what our role is, as an artist, as an academic, as a professor, as a civil society leader, to really take that responsibility and that it is up to us. And as you said, one citizen coming together with one citizen that nobody even hears about is sometimes much more powerful uh, than other things in the media. So I know I've been inspired. I'm sure the students and the others have been here as well. Thank you very, very much for having come. We hope this can be the beginning of a cooperation also in the future. We would love to visit you in Pakistan. Uh, and if we can support some of the initiatives that you have through our network, it would be an honor. And I think we would, we would all benefit. Uh, I also want to thank all of you. And as I just said, whenever you require my services, Myself to come and talk and answer questions. I'm always ready Excellent. to come. And because whenever I come, I always not only represent my country, but I represent all the enlightened people who are seeking for peace all over the world. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Jimmy Engineer. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. No problem.